Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for tuning in today for our Q&A session with Vance Powell. My name is Mark Abrams. I'm the content manager over at PureMix. And we are joined by Vance, who is over in Nashville. Uh, hang on one second with us. Hold on. And yeah, cool. So we are joined by Vance Powell over in Nashville, Tennessee. How you doing, Vance? Hold on a second, your audio. There we go. All right, how you doing, Vance? Hey, hey, I'm good. Cool. So thanks for doing this. Thanks Welcome for. Everybody. Yeah, thanks for doing uh, the videos. The whole Tyler Bryant series, this mixing contest. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's incredible experience. The uh, the thing that I love the most about these videos, which I've kind of talked with you a little bit about this, I had the um, pleasure. Uh, a couple years ago now of going two, to two years ago. Yeah, it's probably like three or something, right? Um, so I got to go to a seminar with Vance at Blackbird in Nashville, and it was a three day seminar. Vance brought a band in and the whole thing was tracked live in one room, just like he does in the videos. But it was amazing how uh, creative he was with the choices. He had booths where he could have shut the doors and isolated the guitar amps and everything, but he just left the doors open and let everything bleed into the room. There was actually a guitar amplifier with the vocalist's second mic going through it, again, pumping right into the room. And that whole experience uh, just taught me how you can be creative with recording and everything doesn't have to be this pristine sound, but you can actually get creative with your tones um, and and really, you know, add some art to the recording process. So that was a okay. huge takeaway for me. And this video series um, was was really fun to make with you. And I remember after we were done with it, feeling like we, we captured that same vibe of the seminar that I was at all in video format. So I think it's like the closest that you could get to actually oh, getting good. the well, room. I'm, uh, I'm glad you dig it. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of long days. It was long days. Mark. Yeah. Long days. <laughs> We worked you a little hard. I think I think I killed Fab. I think during <laughs> the days, literally killed him. Yeah, so he was yeah. too tired to drink wine. So yep. uh, that's that probably tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, that's saying something. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. Cool. So uh, before we jump right in, I, I want to say thank you to the sponsor. Uh, Isotope hooked us up Absolutely. with some prizes for this and got Absolutely. us going. Man, I'm telling you, RX saves my life all the time, mm -hmm. and, um, and ozone every now and then. You know, I, I, you know, sort of brought something to kind of do a little mastering or a little touch up or something, and you know, it's pretty fantastic. It's a lot of a lot of fun tools there. Uh, RX Seven just came out, and uh, yeah, I mean, maybe too too good, but uh, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, how how are you using RX? Well. You know, I record a lot of noisy things, you know, noisy guitar amps, noisy bass amps, you know, things like that. Um, the thing that's popped up lately I really like is uh, uh, I kind of when I'm mixing, like if I get things from other people or, or even stuff I do, you know, I mean, singers get explosives, you know, and, and the, the de explosive, I love that de explosive tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, really works really nice. You know, just use it a little bit at a time where there's places where it's happening without having to sort of draw out the automation or whatever. It does a really good job. Um, RX-7's got a bunch of new stuff in it. Um, uh, I just recorded a track, or I'm mixing a track, where the guitar player is sitting on a chair, and he, he moves, and it, it rustles, it squeaks. There's a de-rustle tool now. Nice. So, uh, you know, and, and it, I mean, it wasn't exactly, you know, I mean, there's no free lunch. So uh, I it took a little bit to, to kind of get it. But I mean, you know, it wasn't like it wasn't like a solo acoustic thing. Mm -hmm. But on a solo acoustic thing, I'd probably use spectral and just clean that stuff up. Yeah, it's really fantastic. It's mm -hmm. really expensive, but it's really fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, for me, um, it's a tool, you know, so it's a tool and a tax write off. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, it's tools. So, you know, we need tools to do our job, mm -hmm. even if it's a piece of software. Yeah. So, yeah. Those guys are great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, they hooked us up with a couple of prizes. Uh, the first place winner is going to win a music production suite of plugins. 
And the second place winner is getting the creative suite. Awesome. I know who they are. <laughs> so Vance, Vance chose the top winners here. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, let's just announce them. All right. So go for we'll it. start with our second place winner. Mm hmm. And I think that is. We still don't have a drum roll sound effect oh, for this I thing. Need a drum roll. Come on. <laughs> Let me see here. All this right. is. Let me, let me look at the. Uh, you you got it. You you do it because you have the right usernames. So. Okay, cool. It is I Ricardo have... Sandoval. <laughs> yeah, say it again. Ricardo Sandoval. Yeah, man. Good work. Good Ooh. work. I, I really like the mix. I like what you did with the the drums are cool. Um, uh, and it's weird. Like I, I, in a perfect world, these two mixes, if I could just cut the verses out of one mix and cut them into the chorus of the other mix, it would be perfect. So uh, I really love um, what you did with the verses in your mix. Uh, but it's just that the other mix, the, the chorus was a little, there was just something going on and the solo was a little better and the, and the tonal balance, just a little better to me, to my speakers. Right. And, and better is all completely subjective. So, uh, you know, without both of these going through a mastering phase, you know, they're both really good mixes. Mm -hmm. There you go. Awesome. And the All winner right. is? So let's check out the first place winner for the music oh, okay. production suite. The username is KLWN. So congratulations. Kalon. <laughs> I guess. Cool. And yeah, so you liked... Sorry, which which way was it? You like the choruses? Yeah, so, like, I really love the choruses and the solo in this mix, and I really love the verses, the sort of a vocal echo, the the the, the tone of the vocal in in uh, Ricardo's mix. Uh, but but overall, this one was a little more. I liked it a little more. It was bigger. I think it's big. It's probably a better mix than my mix. Uh, you know, because you had a lot of time to work on it, which was great. Um, but you know the drum sounded really great the guitar sounded good the, the solo was great i just felt overall uh balance wise it was great the verse vocal could have been a little more something i don't know what the something is it could have been a little more something but overall uh it was really great both of them were great yeah. actually you know um all the mixes i heard were really good so you know it's hard to it's hard to pick from you know really good it's just kind of comes down to a couple nitpicky things yeah yeah what are some of the things that you're listening for you're listening for creativity well, I'm, sort of, I'm listening for you know like when the chorus comes in so like a couple of the mixes the chorus was too um too what's the right word uh too big in a way too wide too 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 displaced from the verse mm. it was like verse 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 chorus that's a great idea but but it should be verse verse chorus if mm. that makes sense it should it should stay within the boundaries you know like kind of a couple you moved out here i hit mono and they just it just kind of all disappeared so you know um, it should feel like it's in your face and then it should just sort of get bigger out here if this I'm using my arms as some sort of weird thing but yeah. you know the band should sound like it's here and then get a little bigger so cool. that's kind of what I was sort of hearing yeah you know and then the verse you know the vocal should just sort of you know kind of park right here in your face yeah you know and then the chorus the vocal should spread not the the vocal the vocals should spread out the guitar should spread out it should just feel like okay this is the fucking chorus yeah so, you know, part of my language i curse <laughs> cool uh yeah so just in general are there any creative things were you listening to stuff that they did with some of the tracking decisions that you made or how they reacted to that that stuff well um you know i i i didn't what i thought was interesting was that it didn't feel to me like like any of the mixes were radically different from what i expected which is cool yeah that's good and um hold on one second here i'm, I'm gonna i need to do something here real quick oh that doesn't work all right um so that's a bad idea uh i was gonna kind of watch the online thing oh. and then realize i'm just watching myself like yeah do this. 
and okay, we're in so like a 40 second delay we're not going to do that so <laughs> um but i wanted to read the online comments but yeah that's all. um there was a couple mixes oops there was a couple mixes where it felt to me like like the like either people's monitors were too bright mm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. or something because it sounded a little closed up mm -hmm. and and that's not definitely not the way i remember the tracks so yeah. so you know sometimes you got to work with your reference you know your your thing so yeah uh, there was a couple songs where there was there was one song where one version where it felt like the voice was way down in the middle sort of mm -hmm. and then the the, the the chorus was just like you know like wow we just really blew this way out of proportion mm -hmm. um so you know but that yeah. happens do you think that there's any monitor placement type issues going on there where somebody would probably blow something just to monitors to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. you know and listening environment mm -hmm. Even the best sounding studios, I mean, my control room, uh, you know, I'm, I've got a project going on uh, that you can't really see, but it's, it's, it's all sort of back there, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, going on to basically fix one little node in my room that um, is not as perfect. And I'm not saying perfect because no room's perfect, right. but it's not as good as I would like it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, I've got Mike, he's building these panels and things and we're going to hang some things over here. Just, yeah. just one, it's just kind of right around one frequency. It just mm -hmm. happens to be about the size of the room. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you just, you just have to kind of deal with it and you have to get a reference. In other words, like you have to work in a room in a room for a while to get your reference from, I'm going to take this mix in and I know now like there's certain frequencies I know that I am not going to be turning up in here because mm -hmm. that frequency may be a, a deficit or like, there's no way I'm turning up 200 cycles in here. Mm -hmm. 200 cycles in this room is a little loud. Yeah. All right. Now that, that being a little loud actually means that there's a little bit of a hole at a hundred. Right. So it's just all about placement. So I'm yeah. working on that right now, but yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, 200 and, is not my favorite. It's not my friend so much in here. Yeah. It's not, and it's not anything super low. The super low is all great. And then above it is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been in here, you know, so, yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, it's just things I'm, I'm, I'm tweaking on. If we can fix it, I'll fix it. Yeah. But, cool. You know, I got to work. And so. how nerdy do you get with that stuff? I don't. Yeah. I don't, I don't get nerdy. I yeah. have a nerdy friend. He came over and did the nerdy thing. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. I don't even want to know really because don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But I do know about that. The 200, 100 thing has been a deal for a little while for me. Yeah. We've console back that sorted, that fixed it a little bit. We've, you know, there's just certain things you can do. And right. the only thing is, I love the way my studio looks. I love the way it feels. I don't want to radically change it. Yeah. So, so um, these little panels we're going to do over on this wall uh, are going to be, um, they're going to be a rock wool sort of base panel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, eight inches deep, really big. They got a lot of mass mm -hmm. and I just need them to pull that. Just, just pull a couple frequencies down a little bit in the room. Yeah. A couple a little note, a couple of resonance spots. Yeah. Uh, it's cool. Nice. And but it's still going to look kind of the same. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. The aesthetic in that room is so inspiring. It's great. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, and we actually we heard a lot of comments about that too, about just how inspiring the live room is with the wood panels and so on and so cool. forth. It's I have really a friend of mine thing. who's a he's a uh, street artist from uh, California, from Southern California. Uh, he runs a, a festival here in Nashville called Money Roots. It's really cool. He's an amazing spray paint artist, mm -hmm. and I think I'm actually going to have him. Uh, I'm going to commission him to do all my big white walls. Oh, neat! So yeah. it'll be it'll look like you're you know. It'll be, it'll be something cool. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, let's go ahead and get to some questions. Uh, we have it. some coming in from the live room. We have some people that submitted some before the Q&A started, so we'll, we'll get to those too. But I'm going to start with one from the live room. And let's go with... Oh, this one's, this is a good topic. Uh, this is Harmoko Aguswan. 
Sorry if I mispronounce anybody's name in advance. And he says, I would like Vance to expand his thoughts on vocal effects via guitar pedals. Oh, well, um, you know, there's a, you know, in, in my room, you guys saw over here, there's a whole panel with a bunch of pedals on it. Uh, you know, th there's no, there's no rules for anything. That's the great thing about music. There's no rules. You, you can do whatever you want. You know, um, I, I, there's a bunch of pedals I really love uh, that work really great on vocals. And then there's a bunch of them that don't work at all. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of germanium fuzz pedals, things like that. They really just don't work. They just turn into some sort of like, you know, stupid, buzzy, fuzzy silliness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I love a lot of the, um, you know, sort of delay based analog delay chorus, you know, flanger. I use the Earthquaker Grand Orbiter all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I use this uh, Caroline pedal, the uh, kilobyte pedal, which is um, kind of a digital pedal, but has a bit crusher sort of vibe in it. Yeah. And of course, my beard verb, I use it all the time. Yeah. Uh, the old MXR uh, flanger, the blue face flanger that I have is great. Mm -hmm. um, there's a company up in Champaign, Illinois, uh, called Analog Outfitters. They make this thing called the Scanner. Yeah. And it's a B3 scanner module uh, with a motor on it. Uh, it's kind of it's that there, guy, right? Uh, yeah. Up there. And uh, I use it all the time. I used it yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, there's you know, sort of no rules. You, you can use whatever you want. Uh, a lot of times, um, I, I would say because I have a great assistant and we have a whole arrangement here for doing recalls and photographs and you know i have um you know hundreds of photos in here from mixes um i say hundreds i think i have about sixty-four thousand, to be honest with you yeah. but um because i have that we can we can look back and i can get a picture for something uh, let me see here if i got a pedal picture yeah so like here's a beard verb picture Mm -hmm. you know so oh, nice so this is one of our photos so we take all these photos of every mix and then i can you know recall them i can bring them back up and you know and we have a database for the patching there's a five micro pro database over here on the computer over there that and that actually comes up on the ipad too you can do it on the ipad which is cool mm -hmm. um but mike never does but i do sometimes <laughs> Uh, because I'll change things when he's not in the room and I'll just change the patch. I'll yeah. patch it myself and then I'll change it in the iPad right here. It's because I'm lazy and I won't go over there. I just do it with yeah. my fingers. <laughs> but um, uh, if you don't have a great assistant and you're just working with yourself, like most people do, which is mm -hmm. I, I was there for years and years, print it. Just print that thing. Mm -hmm. And then the other cool thing is once you print it, you can, you know, process it again right do something else with it make it backwards to you know so anything like that you know that's that's what i'll do i'll just be like oh you know um one of the cool things is my rig the way it's set up is that i have 48 inputs and i have 48 outputs mm -hmm. um and so the console anything that comes back in the console through my channels there's a button on the console called direct you just hit direct i put those things boom and record it and what's even cooler is that I can then um, just turn off the return and set that Pro Tools output, and it's mm -hmm. exactly the same every time. It's right. you know what I mean. It's basically now that output, whatever that output is, like so let's say 41 and 42, my pedals. Uh, I'll just say, hey Mike, just move that patch. And when we move the patch, the output of Pro Tools becomes, which I just recorded, yeah, becomes that return yeah so now it's saved it's printed and i, I don't have to ever recall it right. uh, it doesn't happen very often to be honest with you but uh but uh from time to time it does yeah. you know now how about um say something like project archival you know you're at the end of the end of the project you've got yeah. the gear that you have today and then what happens in five years are you printing everything at the end or are you just saying no. this is what the mix is today no no yeah. no no, no, no. Who cares in five years? Yeah. If somebody wants to recall a mix in five years, 
for some reason, they can pay me to remix it. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, yeah, that, that's silliness. Um, I have had pieces of gear that have broken, mm-hmm. right? And then you just like, well, you know, uh, there's a dead weather mix uh, I did back in the Jack White days that Jack had a trim face pedal, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the really, really rare old tremolo pedal worth a lot of money okay mm-hmm. and we used it on this very one of the very first dead weather songs called hanging from the heavens we used it on her vocals mm-hmm. right we took pictures we did the whole thing everything right two years later they wanted to do an instrumental mix of it right mm-hmm. so i get all the pieces and parts together to do the instrumental no trim face it's on the road with jack <laughs> and that sound was a, a part of the thing they wanted mm-hmm. like well i'm gonna have to just try to get it there wasn't anything that sounded like it yeah so yeah. what did we do well we just at that point in the mix we just cut in the master so it went from my remix two years later to the master for four bars back to my remix Wow. Nobody knew the difference. Yeah. And that's in a, that's just in a trailer for Iron Man. Oh, cool. Uh, Iron Man 2, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, cool. So this know, is you, later you on. Just, yeah. You just kind of figure, try to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Why was I doing a remix? Because Jack did, wouldn't ever do instrumentals or versions. Yeah. He doesn't want that stuff floating around. But he was totally cool with hiring me again to do it again. Yeah. I remixed a whole bunch of White Stripes songs just to make the instrumental because he didn't want them. So yeah. Right? Yeah. It's good. Yeah. It's a really cool, uh, cool mindset. Uh, there's quite a few interviews uh, floating around out there. I actually just heard the tape op interview with you recently. Um, yeah. And that was, that was really, really educational in oh, your workflow with Jack. Oh, a long time ago now. Yeah. <laughs> Seven years. It was a long time. Yeah, I was digging through a little bit. <laughs> yeah, good. Cool. Uh, let's take another question here. You got it. Let's see. Um, actually, let's uh, let's go to one of our pre-submitted questions. So, okay. Let's see where this one's coming from. This one's coming from Satira in Singapore. All right. And they're asking, how often do you get a perfect track just by recording? Meaning, it's baked in to the multi-track. You don't need to mix. You did it. Well, I mean, you're, you know, you kind of always need to mix, mm-hmm. you know, but my goal is that if you put the faders up at zero and you hit play, mm-hmm. it should be really close to the mix. Yeah. So uh, how often do I get that? I try to get it every time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the bigger question is how many times have I screwed up the mix by mixing? Mm. That's the bigger question. Nice. Because there have been many times I have screwed up the track that I cut by mixing it, Mm -hmm. you know, by thinking too hard about it. Yeah. Uh, I just finished a record uh, with a girl from, uh, uh, Norway is amazing record. Uh, the artist name is Karina Franzen and the record is just, I mean, it's, it's mind blowingly bizarre and awesome and fantastic. And I mean, it's, it's great. And when we were mixing, I always have on my console, the rough mix on a button. Mm-hmm. So I can always just switch to the rough and, you know, I mix for a while and I hit the rough and I'm like, whoa, 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 stop. Stop, 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 stop. Hold on. Let me listen to this. Like, okay. Pardon my language. What the fuck am I thinking? You know, what am I? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop. Let's turn all these EQs off. Let's turn everything off. Mm -hmm. Put the faders up at zero and just hit play. And I'm like, oh, interesting. And what had happened was, you know, as we were going along, you know, there's a great Jack White quote he said to me once he said let's mix this like we recorded it last week 
Now, what he meant by that was whatever the last thing you record, like is the coolest thing on the track, mm-hmm. you know, so that suddenly that's too loud. Right. And what had happened with this rough mix is that we, we you know, we're, we're doing these background vocals, we're doing this thing. And, and there was just a, a balance thing that I had landed on when I made the rough that was just really good. And uh, so I sort of started over with that. And then I just, I fought myself tooth and nail to turn EQs on or add a compression or, or whatever. And I just tried to just keep it as best I could in that realm and just mix a little bit. Now, that being said, um, I'm working with an artist right now that'll remain nameless, but uh, most everybody, at least in this country, knows who it is. Um, and we have this track that's about 11 minutes long. It's 11 minutes. And it's a journey, man. It's like, it's got a part at the beginning. It goes to this little weird Calypso part, goes into a total reggae part, and goes into full-on sort of rock guitar at the end mm-hmm. for seven and a half minutes. You guys can try to figure out who it is. <laughs> uh, and one of the rough mixes, we, we did a week up at Power Station in New York doing uh, a bunch of overdubs and edits and just a bunch of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And um, when we got here, he had some ideas about the what we things to do the drums. He wanted it to feel a little more like a like a you know the scientist, a little more like King Tubby sort of vibe. So we did all this stuff, and and some of it was ludicrously cool, and I love it. And then it kind of went out into the world to the people around him, managers and band members and all. And one of the guys was just like, man, you know, that last mix you did, I just love it. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. And so we, and that was down at Power Station in New York. It was a rough mix, it's flat, you know, all the faders at zero, no EQs on, nothing. Just mm-hmm. put the faders up, uh, uh, a pair of PCM 42s for the echo, a PCM 70 for like maybe a little bit of drum reverb or vocal reverb. And then I just hit, I literally just hit record and we talked about, going where we're going to dinner or something you know that's yeah. how i do rough mixes. i don't mm-hmm. mix i just hit record and let it go and um so he sort of was like i think maybe we you know screwed that up and i'm like okay cool well let's see if that power station mix will fit into our master all right and because i print every time i do roughs i i print roughs at the right level yeah right Mm-hmm. And I print, you know, I figure out a way to do it. So I'm always have a way I can print roughs while we're working. Mm-hmm. Right. We flew it in. And what was cool was that even though my console sounded better than the old VR up there, yeah. even though my, what was happening in that mix, even when it was just normal, not the other parts we kind of screwed up, uh, it worked. And it worked because it was this sea change in music. It went from one thing into something radically different, right? right? Mm -hmm. That was recorded at the same time, but recorded differently. And, and it totally worked. Yeah. And it's like, okay, cool. So there's sort of no rules. I mean, I mean, I have cut, I have cut rough mixes into masters all the time. The most important thing is when you, hand your the project that you're tracking off to the artist Mm -hmm. you make sure that thing sounds absolutely as good as possible now that doesn't mean you should be mixing it and writing automation and all that there's nothing worse than getting a record from an artist as a mixer that is full of automation right nothing is worse yeah because that's just like you're mixing the record not me yeah so what do i do i just cut all that shit out Mm -hmm. i just do my own take on it yeah um sometimes that bites me so Mm -hmm. you know always rename your session right never use the you know there's a whole bunch of things there and never use the client's hard drive copy it onto your drive yeah the client's hard drive pristine so if you need to pull up that automation because there's something that's going on there that's integral to the mix you can do it there's still a copy out there yeah. You can, yeah, there's a copy of it. Usually it's just on my drive. I just, we just, you know, mm-hmm. but um, just make your rough mixes and just make them as good as possible. I mean, on this track, if you were to take this track and just put it at zero, you know, more or less you could hit play and it would just play back okay. 
Yeah. You know, so on Aftershock. And that's kind of my goal. Yep. Yeah. So I think the question was how often. I try to make it as often as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's my goal. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> people, people commented on that a bit too, that um, – the sound of the drums was so baked into the multi-track they were wondering on uh, certain parts if they should you know if they felt like something was compressed if they should automate dynamics in and i think one of the really cool that. what's that why would people do that yeah that's one of the cool yeah, things about this multi-track it sounds great turn yeah. it up yep yeah and it's it's already the intent is there yeah the, yeah it's all there yep should all yeah. work you yeah, know, and everybody is also reacting to that in the session too. They're hearing, you know, the the vibe that you're doing with whatever you have going on in the engineering side. They're reacting to that and they're playing, and that's what the tone of that recording at that moment was. Exactly. Yeah, and I think there's a great awesome. great lesson in that. It's awesome. Yeah, cool. Let's do another question. People make, I think I think that there's a there's there's multiple different ways of of trying to do this. You know, um, if you just put microphones on every instrument or whatever, and you just record with mic pre's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you have to kind of get a balance and do some EQ, which tons of people do these days because they're because every, every ad in the world is telling you that's how you do it. Right. Instead of like going through a console or whatever and bussing things together or whatever, you know, you will get a product that is very good and very clear and very, very great recording and all that. It'll have no, sound to it mm -hmm. it won't have a it won't have a thing not to me right so i get sessions all the time that are that way three kick drum tracks two snare drum tracks mm -hmm. you know six tom tracks with three toms top right. and bottom <laughs> you know what i mean and i'm just like all right yeah okay cool yep that those all sound really cool right that is, they just sound like what they sound like yeah, Where's by themselves. The, what, what's interesting in this, you know? Mm -hmm. So, look, we can all record really well, and, and you know, this is just me talking. Yeah. Everybody's got their own their own thing. Um, you know, make take some take some chances, make some choices. You know, mm -hmm. screw things up, learn from them. You yeah. Know. And and what do you do when you get a session like that? So there's no, you know, let's. Let's call it vibe baked into the multi-track. And then, 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 then my job as a mixer to try to is try to find something somewhere, mm -hmm. find something or focus on something or make something. Mm -hmm. You know, make something is actually happens more often than not. Yeah. You know, with uh, some delay or distortion or uh, maybe like a reverb pedal with a distortion pedal after it mm -hmm. or, you know, something compression, you know, something that makes the track interesting. I mean, I, I have, I, I got a record to mix. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but I got a record to mix recently and, and everything about it was great. None of it fit together. None of it. Mm -hmm. If you soloed all the instruments, the acoustic guitar, wow, that sounds beautiful. It's a great sound acoustic guitar, electric guitar. Yeah, man, that's, awesome bass sounded good played a five string which i hate but yeah. whatever you know fine uh drums all the drums sounded like samples they were great cymbals were sounded like samples and they might have been mm -hmm. i don't know when you put all the faders up at zero and it was just a fucking mess none of it sounded right nothing mm -hmm. was carved around each other you know the you know the the acoustic guitars are so full bodied that they made the guitars tubby, the yeah. electric guitars tubby. The electric guitars were so like had enough edge on them, but the low end was so heavy that now that it was all like, sounded like it was in the bass. The bass he's playing five, the, the low, you know, the B string all the fucking time. <laughs> like, okay, cool. So now the bass and the kick drum are in the wrong space. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I just had to carve my ass off to make it all, you know, do this. Have its own spot. Yeah. Otherwise it's just, it's just all over the top. You can't hear what's going on. Right. So, yeah. you know, that stuff happens all the time. Yeah. That's the whole thing of like, okay, let's, let's record all these instruments independently of each other. 
So they have no relationship to each other. There's no electric guitar in the drums. Right. There's no drums in anything else. There's no acoustic guitar. You know, there's no drums in the, you know, like none of them. It just sounded like everything was recorded. It actually sounded like everything was recorded in a completely different studio. Yeah. And nobody was hearing any of the others other than follow a chart and do the click. Sorry. That's yeah. My email. Oh, no. It's just okay. had like a click check in the chart to go off of. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How awesome is that? You know so, what I mean? I mean that's, that's, that's not really awesome. So. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the number one question that we get uh, all the time from people is I want to know how to make my tracks better at home. Um, and in the, in the mixing contest too, we always hear from people uh, when they get something like uh, what you created, or if we do something, you know, with a red hot chili peppers track or something, it's really right. fun to mix those tracks, but that's not real world life for a lot of us. So if you had a tip for everybody, yeah. how would you say? Yeah, I mean, like Red Hot Chili Peppers tracks, there, there's no budget in there. They can spend as much time as they want. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. You know. If you had to suggest to somebody. It doesn't work that way. You know, yeah. especially not even anymore. I don't even know it works that way for them. But uh, <laughs> anymore. But, but you know what I mean? It's like, you know. So how do you make your tracks that you're doing in your home studio? How do you make them better? Well... I would say, you know, if you have a small space, a lot of microphones will do you no good. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the smaller the space, the fewer microphones you need. You know, pick, you know, find a microphone that sounds really good and use it for, you know, a major portion of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't always work, you know, but a lot of times it does. You know, and so, I don't know, it's kind of a tough one. Everybody's situation is different, especially everybody's listening situation is different. Mm. Trying to make sure your listening situation is as as good as you can get it, you know. Um, sometimes in really small rooms, you have to really make it really dead, you know, and it's hard mm -hmm. to make, you know, uh, get you a piece of, you know, like this rock wall you got back behind you, get a little bit of diffusion, Mm -hmm. High end, high frequency diffusion, pad every pad everything. You know, try to soak as much up as much of everything under four hundred as you can. You know, mm -hmm. or two hundred really, you know, three hundred. Yeah. I don't know, but um, so your localization is better. You know, you figure out where you're because you know below a certain frequency you can't hear where it's at. Yeah. So try and to. And you're figure even out talking about eight inch traps of you know rock wool to. Yeah, I'm talking about yeah or. Stuff. You know, an eight-inch trap of rock wool is a low-frequency trap. Mm -hmm. 703 panels, like what you got behind you, is really mm -hmm. a mid-high, right. mid-frequency trap, mm -hmm. you know, um, or high-frequency trap. So, you know, find it, find it, stand in the room and see if it sounds good. Yeah. You know, I, I struggle from time to time with, with this thing, the computer. Mm -hmm. you know? And my way of dealing with it is it, it tends to be, like I have it on a rolling cart, which, by the way, I can just show you. Yeah. You know, it's right here, right? So I have it on a rolling cart here. It's a 27 inch iMac, Retin iMac. And um, I do, it's slanted away from me. So I slide it out of the way. Even just you and I speaking, I can hear this as I move it closer to me. Yeah. So if you're mixing in Pro Tools and this thing is right in front of you, yeah. you're going to hear it. Mm -hmm. High frequencies are going to bounce off it. You know, sometimes that's not a good thing, you know? So mm -hmm. you have to get your listening environment as 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 good as you can, mm -hmm. as, as good as you can. I guess is that's right. Yeah, it, you need to get it as balanced as possible. If I speak and I'm talking, what do I hear? What comes back to me? Mm -hmm. If I move this closer, I hear it. Yeah. If, if I look forward, like if I'm like I'm mixing right now, and I look forward and speak forward. I really, I can hear a little bit of my speakers, but kind of not really. I hear this thing, yeah. but that's part of my world. It's right. fine. It's, yep. You know, so unless you're mixing in virtual reality in the middle of this perfect space, we, we just have to find the, the reference that works for us. Right. You know? And I think that's the deal. Get, get really good speakers um, and a good monitor controller. 
and try your best to not have the speak the monitor in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, if that means going to the you know local electronic store and buying a seventy inch or whatever flat screen 4k monitor and putting it behind your speakers mm -hmm. or somewhere where you can work and look forward and you know it's whatever it's not it's ways from you mm -hmm. you know i have friends who do that they they just put it between their speakers they don't have any speakers right in front of them they, they kind of put it between their main speakers mm -hmm. a big monitor six feet back and you can't you can see it it's big yeah. but you can't hear it that's yeah. probably a good idea yeah i don't know you know uh, everybody's, everybody's thing is better. When I started, um, with, when I, no, when I started there wasn't a computer, you mm -hmm. know, it was tape machines, you had a remote. So doing this working sideways, the way I work was the way we did it. Right. All the time. Yeah. That's how you, that's how you did it. Um, you know, and sometimes it was over here, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, I'm better with this hand. So. My yeah, first student worked in it was in the console right here, the remote. So I got really good doing it with my left hand. Yeah. And, and then years later, I the next a few years later, the next day I worked at it was on a card or on my right side. And it was like I would just have to kind of do this my left hand and finally I got good at it over here, you know. But yeah. uh, you know, that's all I that's all I can say. I'm yeah. yammering all about nothing. Yeah. Let's do another question. Uh, we'll take one of the pre submitted ones. And this question comes from, again, sorry about the name, Nusko from Poland. Ah, Poland. I've and been, I've asked, recorded in Poland. Awesome. In, in, what city? Uh, yeah, in uh, Gdansk. Ah. Yeah. Nice. Custom Is that record 34. out? Yep. Yeah. Custom 34. It's a band called OCN. Cool. Years ago. Good one to check out. Nice, nice studio. Cool. So his question is, could you tell us something more about how you use guitar effects while recording drums? Do you always use one taste mic? Also, I love the wooden boards on your walls in your recording room. It's super cool. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So those, those, those boards, that is a barn, uh, that was over a hundred years old. That was made up in Kentucky that, um, they, a company that makes reclaimed wood took it apart. They literally mm -hmm. just took the barn apart, put it in on a big truck, and I bought a, about half of it. Um, well, well, I can't say half of it. I, I don't know. It was a lot of money. Those the, that barn wood, but that that all that wood, that fence we call it, mm -hmm. is about a hundred years old. And uh, it was uh, all that we we only cut the bottoms, mm -hmm. so all the angles and weird things you see that was from where they the barn was big so they would put a piece up and then they would cut it and put another piece up you know mm -hmm. so that it was on a seam and not flat so water wouldn't sit in it it's yeah. funny and so all those angles were all just that was I, I didn't cut any of that we could just cut the bottoms yeah uh, those were big eight foot planks wow and um uh it was pretty expensive to be yeah. honest with you. wood <laughs> that was junk um but um well thank you um uh, I use a taste mic all the time uh, when I'm cutting drums. Uh, sometimes it, it usually always goes through the same pedals, the polyset pedal and then the uh, beard verb pedal, just because the beard verb pedal has a, it's kind of a cool thing in a, in a weird way. When you turn the, the delay on, there's a, there's a filtering that happens that, uh i like i don't know you know i don't know what it is it's just part of the thing even if i turn the delay all the way off it's there yeah so there's something in the circuit that uh even with it, the delay all the way down is happening that is cool and uh so i like that but uh i i pretty much always will have a track or a mic or something in the room, like like a thing I've used a bunch is I've used like a uh, like an RCA forty four through a tape echo, hmm. you know. So it sounds like, you know, Elvis's mic when Elvis wasn't singing, you know, and all those tracks, you know, because that's kind of how they did it, you yeah. know. So I mean, um, you know, you just you put your tape echo and you get your tape echo and you turn it on and you you put it on that track, and then it just that's just kind of the thing, yeah, you know. Um, it depends on the music style, of course. Yeah, yeah, cool. 
for somebody yeah, who's you know, that thing that that thing that you came to the blackbird thing yeah if you remember i had a taste mic going through an amp in the room i do and and just the amp like sounding really crunchy and distorted just sort of blasting out into the room yeah and that's pretty cool sometimes you make a feedback and weird shit but that sometimes that's all right yeah that can be um, part of the fun yeah i uh i'm not gonna lie i did that on a session the next week <laughs> sometimes, it works, sometimes it doesn't yeah yeah they only looked at me like i was crazy for a couple of seconds and they're like oh that sounds kind of cool <laughs> i think what's really cool if you have a little mixer like a little mackie or something mm-hmm. is just take a pair of 57s and put a 57 on the kick and a 57 on the snare mm-hmm. run them into the mackie then run that to your guitar amp and and you know drive the turn the mackie up so that the signal going you know it's like a line level signal mm-hmm. into your guitar amp and that's going to blow up the preamp of the amp and just turn that up so just get it so it won't squall you know what i mean mm-hmm. but just kind of get that like really direct kick and snare into that amp and just amplify that into the room a bit yeah. and that's that sometimes works out really well you know awesome uh, put it put the amp behind the drummer facing the other direction mm-hmm. you know, things like that you know what i mean just you know just try things yeah cool oh. i love the creativity uh let's do one more question from the live room here okay and Let's Hi, see. I tried to watch you, but I can't. It's, <laughs> it's very trippy I'm when you see the 40 second delay. Watching me <laughs> do things, you know, it's too weird. Oh, this is a good one. Um, Robert Boyer asks, what is the right level that you print your mixes at? You mentioned that a little earlier. The correct level is mm-hmm. the correct level. You know, I use a console, so I print, I try to print all my mixes in between the threes. Mm-hmm. In other words, like put your VUs up, right? A VU meter. And zero is, you know, plus four DBV. Everybody knows all this DBV, DBU shit, mm-hmm. uh, which would be uh, minus 18 in the digital world, DBFS for me. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I try to print around zero. So between minus three and plus three, yeah. somewhere, move the fader, you know, bounce it around. Yeah. Park that in that mix, in that area. That's where I print. It's not everybody, you know. Andrew Shep's prints full bore, you know, so Mm -hmm. that doesn't, you know, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I don't. That doesn't mean he's wrong. (laughs) Obviously, he's not wrong. And uh, I can already hear the next question that would be coming, um, which would definitely pertain to mastering. Do you work with mastering engineers? What do you expect? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not mastering anything of mine. Yeah. Data history weird yeah I don't, have, I don't have a sister but uh yeah no i i i i like to say i'd like to leave you know some room here for somebody else to make some money mm-hmm. <laughs> but a lot of guys don't especially guys who are mixing singles mm-hmm. you know because they they're they're you know they're doing it to deliver to the a and r guy the record label and the band and everybody and you know they it's, it's got to be as loud and slamming as possible and all that i get all that I totally get it. I, it's just not my, it's not in my wheelhouse. Yeah. I print, um, if everybody who's seen the session sees, I've got that heater track. Mm-hmm. That's that L2. I had 7 dB of gain and I just put up, uh, you know, I put like a, a, a ceiling on it and you know, it hits a little bit with the peaks, but it basically just elevates it up close to mastering. It's just yeah. close. Mm-hmm. but still tons of dynamics you know yeah. so yeah that's my use, that's my vibe yeah when you use a mastering guy is there something that you're looking for to get back in the master or you just kind of throw it out there it sound like it's all been it was all recorded at exactly the same time and mixed at exactly the same time and that every song has a theme that runs through the whole record so it sounds like this record sounds like this record Mm-hmm. That's what I want. Yeah. And mastering guys are really the only way to do that because, you know, who knows when it was recorded, you know, I mean, even if I do two songs a day, you know, a 10 song record is going to take five or six days, mm-hmm. you know, that's five or six days of making choices and decisions. So, you know, your, your things change and whatever. And if you're, even if you're doing one song a day, now we're talking about, you know, 10 or 12 days, yeah. that's even longer time. So, you know, I want to sort of, I want, I want the mastering engineer to sort of go, oh, you know what? This song 
because maybe it was a little later in the day. It's a little brighter. And yeah. let's, let's, let's balance that with the song earlier in the day. Right. Or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's great. And Do you, you know, have I, a guy I mean, that you work with more than I have the other? A whole bunch of them. Uh, yeah. um, uh, my friend Richard Dodd, who I love. Um, Pete Lyman, who I mm -hmm. love. Chris Athens, who is maybe like the most successful mastering engineer in the world at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because he's masters Drake and Childish Gambino yeah. and Mickey, Mickey Minaj and all these rap artists, Busta Rhymes and Rick Ross and all these guys. So literally like he, he at one point had 19 songs in the top 40, <laughs> and he had nine in the top 10. I mean, it's just crazy. You yeah. know, uh, he's awesome. He's great. Um, and I love him. You guys yeah. should have him on. He's awesome. Yeah, yeah He's I'd love to. Good. Yeah, I love yeah. him. And uh, you guys, I, I, I want to have a talk show, him and I, just him and I, a talk show would be fun. Nice. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Ludwig is amazing. Ted mm -hmm. Jensen is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg Calby's great. You know, uh, yeah. there, there's tons of great mastering guys. Yeah. You know, you can, you can pick any of the greats and be like, yeah, you're going to get a good job. Yeah. Done. Um, you know, it's all, it's all about the budget and it's about the sound. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, uh, there's a few other people that I've used recently that are pretty good. Um, and you know, from time to time I've, uh, I've had bands pick their mastering engineer because they have a relationship mm -hmm. and I've always, not always, but I've a couple of times been really happy with it. Mm -hmm. and a couple of times I've been like, Hmm man you know <laughs> i it's all about having a relationship with people and the guys that i've spoke of i have a relationship with yeah you know i had a mastering engineer ask me for stems once i told him to fuck himself mm -hmm. you know what i mean <laughs> uh if a mastering engineer asks you for stems don't you know you, you're something's wrong right now they could be wrong you could be wrong Sure. But either way, in that that that's disqualifying for me. Yeah. I had Master Engineer ask me once for all the vocal up mixes. That was like I just said no. Yeah. I said how about no? Yeah. Why don't you answer what you got and then let me make that decision? Right. You know, I'm the producer, you're not right. the master. Um, and he sent it to me and I was like, Yeah, no, this is great. It's out and everybody loves it. Yeah. So so you know. It's a, it's a, it's a weird deal. You know, the mastering in the last couple of years has tried and tried and tried to get a little more and a little more into the record making side. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that's the point. Right. And a lot of people don't realize that mastering, mastering was a job that was meant to take this thing that we do as mixers, engineers, recording you know recording artists and producers and fit it onto a completely imperfect playback medium mm -hmm. right not like oh well you know th this this is sort of an argument for the guys who are mastering themselves to be honest with you right. you know the guys who are delivering mixes that don't need mastering you know because now you don't have to fit it into an imperfect medium other than streaming is imperfect, but, 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 you know, CDs aren't imperfect, you know, right. I mean, yeah. Okay. High def, whatever, you know, you know, we could go on on that tangent for a while. Right. right. I deliver 96, 24 mixes all the time. And, uh, I record at 96, 24 all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've recorded 96, 32 and you know, I can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. you no, know? uh, I'm 54. Trust me. I can't tell the difference. Yeah. Uh, so 24 is perfect fine yeah. and um i've recorded 44 1 24 uh that's a sound yeah i've done bands i've done rock and roll bands to get that sound it, it's a sound um but mastering guys you know once they sort of got to a point where they could i guess start thinking that asking for stems and multi-band compressing things and blah 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 and this and that that's that's when they jump the shark for me right you know Mm -hmm. Because that's just, you know, hey, become a mixer. Right. But again, you know, your mileage may vary and these are my opinions. Sure. Sure. You know. 
cool. I, I have a friend who's, who's a friend, a friend of mine, very, 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 very famous mastering engineer, you know, called me one time and, and, and told me that he thought there was something wrong with my room because, uh, you know, the kick drum didn't really just do what he felt like it should do or whatever. And I remember my reply. I was like, uh, wow, I recorded uh, or mixed 50 records in my room this year or last mm. year. Was, you know, not a one of those 50 records, mastering engineer ever said, hey, man, you know, I think something's wrong with your room. Because Maybe you don't like the way the kick drum sounds. Right. Why in the world do you think calling me and telling me that, you know, you think my room is wrong? Mm -hmm. You know what? How fucking presumptuous of you. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then I said, hey, but I love you anyway. But right. you're not getting, you know, but no. Yeah. 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 Master the mix. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's it, Yeah. You know, Miles Davis said it best. If it's on the record, it's perfect. Right. So, you know, a bunch of guys or people sitting around talking about the way something sounds, how much they sound or like the way it sounds or they don't like it or whatever. What good does that do, man? Yeah. Is the, is the song, are the songs good? Mm -hmm. Do you dig it? You know, like, like in, to me, it's like, is the song good? Is it a great performance? you like those two things okay cool sound how does it sound well it's kind of down here somewhere right yeah as much as i hate to say it because we think we're so important but yeah right yeah but you when know. you really look at it i mean you can look back decades in the records that were made forever ago and by today's standards you know maybe they yeah. don't sound so great but they're amazing yeah, records. I, mean, I hate to say it louis louis sold millions of records it's one microphone in yeah a garage. right it's horrible fucking recording mm -hmm. all right but i had a thing Next topic <laughs> yeah so uh, another question from the live room uh do you set up the amps and tune the drums you record yourself or do you let the musicians do it themselves well i set up the amps and a lot of times they're my drums like this session those are my drums mm -hmm. and uh I think for this session, actually, I have a friend of mine who's a, guitar, a drum tech in town. I had him come over and put new heads on and tune it. Yeah. That's tip pretty typical. If I'm producing something, you know, I, it's not like I want people to play my drums, but yeah. I'll, I'll usually say, you know, ahead of time, we've usually talked to the band or I or whatever, and they're like, um, you know. And sometimes it, it doesn't work out. I mean, sometimes it's the drummer's drums. You know what I mean? I usually try bands I'm producing and or recording. I usually try to go see them or see them rehearse or something along those lines. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I've gone into a record and the drummer is, you know, the, like he's playing drums that sound really bad and they don't sound right with the kit, you know, like the Tom's are out of tune and all. And I'll be like, okay, we got to sort this out. Yeah. You know, I'll go in and tune them. All. And as far as guitar amps, you know, sometimes I'll be like, Hey, can I kick a little top end off or, can I add a little top end or, you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. But, but a lot of times, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a thing. I want to hear what the band's doing. I want to hear what gear they have, blah, blah, blah. All that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And do you find, let's say that, you know, um, it's obviously didn't happen, but let's say that Tyler came in that day and he said, Vance, I'm playing this half stack. Yep. Done it. Yeah. Done it. And what well, do you, do you just well, make fun? Well, you just sort of have to figure out how that works. Yeah. You put it somewhere or I put, I put a blanket over it or, you know, mm -hmm. something. You just have to deal with it. Uh, there's a great band from Nashville. They actually just had their last show. Uh, uh, ma amazing. One of the best live bands I've ever seen, ever. Bar everybody else. I mean, bar none. Um, and but they just have a terrible name. Uh, they're called Diarrhea Planet. Oh, yeah. And uh, they came in and we did, I did their record. I recorded and mixed the entire record in eight days. And they played four half stacks and drums in my library. Wow. And it works. Yeah. You know, you just have to figure it out. Cool. I baffled between each one of them and no headphones. They stood in front of their amps and drums and everybody. Just played. You know. Yeah. The bass player was the only guy's wearing headphones because his amp was around the corner. Yeah. 
but he you was got in the short one. stick. <laughs> yeah, he kind of got he kind of got fucked on that. But yeah. Right, <laughs> guys. <laughs> uh, let's take another one from the pre-submitted. So this question comes from Vlad in Moscow. Vlad. And his question is, what Stay level? Stay out of our elections, Vlad. <laughs> just Mr. Putin. <laughs> He says, what levels do you monitor at during mixing? And do you calibrate your speakers with an SPL meter? Yes, 85 dB. 75 to 85 dB. Actually, I think that I actually mix closer to 75. But never any louder when mixing. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit at first when I put it on the big, so you got to figure that out, you know. Yeah. But I, tr I try to keep it, you know, pretty quiet. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. How about during tracking? Yeah, no, nah, I kind of let it fly. Yeah. You know, I think you were around for that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. pretty loud. It's part of the vibe, though. Yeah, you have yeah. to get it kind of loud to figure out what's going on there, mm -hmm. to get the feel of it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably closer to 100 or so. Right. Yeah. Do you... Uh, I try not all day that way. Well, I'll right. just try to do it at first and then kind of turn down. Yeah. So... Hey, uh, so what happens when you only have a couple of days for a project and you know, you, you have a super loud tracking date and then you got to jump into the mix later that day or the next morning. Uh, I just try to take a break. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it, it, sometimes it takes eight hours, eight or nine hours, sort of, you know, let everything relax. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yep. All right. Let's do another one from the pre -submitted. Next one comes from Jake. I think it's Jenkins in Port Washington, Wisconsin. Cool. And he says, one of the most impressive parts of this mix, which is full of impressive parts, is the clarity and impact of the rhythm guitars. What tips do you have for mixing electric guitars to avoid smearing and keep them present without harshness? Find a good, good find, get a good guitar player. Mm -hmm. first. Secondly, um, small amps always sound bigger than big amps. Always. They always do. Yeah. Uh, move the microphones around to find the right spot. I've sort of come upon this thing, if you see in the video, where I do the microphones, and I'm doing a condenser and then a, a 57, but a 57 will just work fine. A ribbon and a 57, either one, mm -hmm. will work out pretty good. Um, find that spot, the sweet spot in the cone. There's, there's kind of a little trick. You, you really want to do it when no one's around. I know that sounds, but, but you're going to, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Take the guitar amp and turn it wide open with nothing plugged in. So it's just hiss, mm. right? Put the microphone up, solo it on your board, right? Or on your whatever. Route it to your headphones, to your Q amp, right? Go to your Q amp. Put your headphones on, turn it down, lay down in front of it, or take the microphone and just hold it in your hand, turn the Q amp up, move it around until that hiss goes from to, you know, till it sounds, the microphone's hearing what your ear is hearing. And then mark it, or just remember where it is, put the mic there. Yeah. Because a cone's a cone. So, you know, it's, there's a spot where it's going to kind of work, you know, um, a lot of guitar, a lot of players put it, you know, back a foot or so, mm -hmm. a lot of ears. That's fine. It doesn't get that pasted to the, to the, you know, pasted to the uh, grill cloth sort of vibe that I like. Yeah. It's really in your face. Right. And then don't use any compression when you're cutting it. Do yeah. that after. You know, cool. let, let the amp do that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, solos, yeah. on the other hand, I compress all the time. Going to tape? I want to print that sound. I want to get that sound. Mm -hmm. You know, the rhythm guitars, I never, ever do compress. I never cut with compression. Yeah. Cool. Unless it's like that guy that the one guitar in the band sort of guy and he plays lead and he plays rhythm and he solos then i'll just bake that sound right you know because then you kind of have to kind of do it right to make it work. yeah to make you it know. feel like one piece like a rockabilly band or like a you know like a 
you know, that more that sort of that kind of vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to take one from the live room here and hi everybody. Let's see. Okay. I have an interesting one. Um, so this comes from Andres and he asks, in your opinion, what's the best tool to emulate guitar amps? And as I want to add a little piece to that, have you run into somebody with uh, an amp simulator that they really, really just wanted to use? Uh, no. Yeah. Um, every now and then I get mixes, I get things from people and they record the DI. Uh, The best the best amp sim that I've heard of all of them is the UAD sixty five deluxe or fifty six mm -hmm. deluxe. Um, it fits all of the uh, all the things. It's a small amp. Mm -hmm. It's a small speaker, and then when UA was designing that, they have all the microphones that I like to use. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, <laughs> It works really well. I have a friend who has an aux, the set top box thing. Mm -hmm. It's not really an amp sim, it's more a cabinet sim. Yeah. It's really cool. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody ever came in and said, hey, I just, I played through this amp sim? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I'd be like, yeah, cool. Okay. Take that and let's plug it into this amp. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'd, do, I'd probably do that. I want to hear the cone. I got to move air. Yeah. But that being said, the uh, 56 Deluxe is awesome on everything. And I have put it on guitars in mixes that mm -hmm. were recorded with an amp. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just, just, it just, there's a tonal thing I like about it. Yeah. Whirly, it's fantastic. Yeah. Whirly uh, B3, it's great. Um, what else? Uh, it's cool because you can get it in stereo. You know, you can put a stereo version of it on. Which is yeah. Really cool if you have B three, you know, because now you got two of them. Right. Um, you know, it's it's really great. Yeah. I have anything else that sounds good. I mean, you know, Sans amp is cool. The Sans amp and the plug in and the pedal, cool. Mm -hmm. Don't sound like an amp. Right. But they sound cool on all kinds of things. I mean, I I have one right there. Yeah. I never use it for guitars. I can tell you that. Yeah. So cool. If you have a UAD, there's there's a really cool. It's not an amp sim. It's an EQ sort of distortion thing. Um, if you have a UAD card, the sixty nine Helios or the new Helios plugin, I have a preset called um, in there. I think it's called Guitar Solo Helper or something like that. It's using the mic pre on the Helios. It's set in mic pre mode really cool sound really nice man just really like makes guitars just bark and really nice yeah i'm gonna have to check that out cool let's do another pre-submitted and this one comes from elliot in paris it's probably just fab saying that his name is elliot <laughs> oh elliot <laughs> oh fab cool uh so he says hi vance in my opinion whorehound by the dead weather is your best record that i've heard how did you work with Jack White on it? Did the recording process make 75% of the final result or did you spend a long time on the mix as well? All right, Whorehound is an interesting story. Whorehound was the very first record we did at Third Man Records in his studio. Mm -hmm. um, I had no assistant for the record because I didn't, we were supposed to just cut a single, right? This dead weather idea was, was Allison was on tour with Raconteurs uh, as the opening act for the Kills. Dean was the, the um, Dean Fertitta, the guitar player, keyboard player. Mm -hmm. He was the utility guy for the Raconteurs on that tour. Mm -hmm. So they were like, oh, we want to do this gothy single. And they did this song called Our Friends Electric, which is a two-way army, Gary Newman two-way army song. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to do with that. I was on the road. I was in, actually, I was at AES when that happened. And uh, so then they had recorded that. 
with um, their live sound engineer had recorded it. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I did a lot of editing on that. We did a bunch of editing and then we mixed it. And then they wanted to do a B-side, all right? Mm -hmm. Which is pretty hilarious because what ended up happening was that um, the B-side became the A-side and uh, then we just kept recording. So really what happened was we recorded Hanging from the Heavens and um, then it was like, oh, I got this other jam and we recorded that. So we recorded the whole record in about seven or eight days and mixed it in about seven days. Mm. Um, it's an eight track record. It's all eight track, two inch, eight track, seven and a half. Um, there's no automation. So, you know, there was three of us, LJ, Jack and I over these eight faders. Yeah. Just, you know, and eight channels. So Jack's desk, which was cool, is a 16 channel board. So I could malt some things. So one of the cool things that happened was by malting things, we could have like, okay, now something could pan or now we change sounds or, or it goes from what happened a lot was, okay, now the guitar solo is on the vocal track. So the, it's, it's vocal, 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 guitar solo, guitar solo, guitar solo, vocal. So, okay, cool. That, we, we, we're going to put those tracks down there. Mm -hmm. So each one of us, the three of us, we had a little script. We had to roll through that script as we were mixing. It was all mixed manually. And a couple songs took a little bit. Um, there's a song on there called Treat Me Like Your Mother. Yeah. Uh, that song took four days to mix. Wow. It's every track of all eight tracks is filled every second. Wow. Of every it's just it's just like if you were to dump it into Pro Tools, it would be eight track blob. Yeah. Everything is full. Guitar solo is on the vocal tracks. Vocal tracks are where the guitar are. There's you know there's there's shaker where there's not other things. I mean it's yeah yeah you know, and one track of drums. Yeah, but it's not one like half. that's a mistake. I mean that's you guys chose that format. That's part of the sound. That's mm -hmm. part of that recordings creation. The way it sounds. The way it sounds. Yeah. Yep. And there's a couple, there's a, there's a, there's some, there's a couple great mistakes on there that, you know, maybe sometime we'll, I'll get a chance to mix that for pure mix. You guys can see it, but there's a, some, a couple really sizable mistakes that um, Bob Ludwig fixed two of them. Mm -hmm. There was an edit, a two inch edit I made on, there's an instrumental song and it's kind of at the end and there's a snare drum and I, I made the edit uh, but the track, the drum track was on, uh, on that track, track three. Mm -hmm. So I made the edit on the kick drum, which is fine. But when you make the edit, cause it's going so slow, I actually cut the beginning of the snare drum on ah. or something. Mm -hmm. and so I had to have Bob. And so he flew in, in the master, the, the beat, right. The beat a bar earlier into that bar. Yeah. And it was like, you know, this was a tape edit thing. It was like, it was the first time I really was editing tape at seven and a half. And man, let me tell you, seven and a half is not easy. You know, that yeah. seven inches is that the whole second. It's not like 30 that the second's this big. It's like, yeah. it's that big. So every wow. beat is like really, really tiny in there. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. No yeah, it's crazy. So you had just cut the transient off and then he. I just accidentally yeah. cut the transient of the, yeah. the snare and he fixed it. Yeah. Did you, he did it in the master. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I love those stories. It's <laughs> in love it's really with that cool. record as well, too. Uh, let's take one more from the um, pre-submitted. You got let's it. See. This one comes from Joe Romero, San Diego, California. Hi, Joe. And he asks, when you first open up a session from a client, what do you listen to and how do you listen? Ah, so like a mix, a mix session. Um, well, the first thing that happens is uh, I don't open it first. Uh, my assistant Mike does. Mm -hmm. So the first thing Mike does is either he does it in uh, my B room because I have the exact same IO. I have a 32 channel desk up there. This is a 48 channel desk, but he has 32 up there. Um, he opens it and sets it up on the desk up there so that when he opens it down here, it's everything's mm -hmm. here. And it's ready. Cool. He will also balance levels a little bit if it's wacky do mm -hmm. which almost all of them are uh so he'll get it so up there so there's a, a balance just a balance 
no EQ, none of that, just a, just a level balance. So you can hear yeah. everything. Then when I open it, what I'll do is I'll just put it on, I hit play, and I just listen through it once, listen to the track. And then I'll be like, okay, let me hear it again. I'll listen to it again. And at that point, I'll start sort of figuring out what's what. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, by about the third pass through, I've kind of figured out uh, how the mix is going to work. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, in other words, like, okay, cool. The really important part here is um, there's this guitar part that plays. And then there's this other guitar that's sort of the hook. And that goes with the vocals, the mechanical vocals. These mm -hmm. are all the, you know, maybe the keyboards are just sort of, you know, filling or maybe the keyboards, the hook or, yeah. well, what is it that's interesting to me? And then I'll just sort of, you know, I slide over here and I do something and then I slide back over here. <laughs> And I slide back and forth and kind of move faders around. I have groupers here in the middle of the desk, right below me here. And I'll slide those back and forth and sort of figure out like, you know, that's how this feel. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, and then it just starts coming together. Yeah. You know, or I say, fuck it. And I turn all the faders down and I just start my own, do my own thing, mm -hmm. bring the drums up. Uh, oftentimes I'll get everything sort of like, cool. Sounds great. All right. I, like, ah, oh, it's too crowded. Turn it all down. Turn it back up a piece at a time. Find yeah. out what's important. Yeah. Cool. You should, you should always be ready at any time to turn everything down and start over. Right. Yeah, and not be too attached to things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, so I see you have a clutch shirt on. Yes. I didn't even ask you about that record. Yes. So. Came out last week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is one that Vance just did. And uh, is this your most recent record that came out? Well, I did it. I recorded it in January. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's the most current thing that's come out. Um, you know, it's sort of major thing. I yeah. Guess. You yeah. know what I mean? What's the uh, yeah. name of the record? Book of Bad Decisions. Nice. Yeah, and uh, we cut it here three weeks uh, with the band. Um, we did it probably a lot different than their last few records. Uh, they kind of wanted to do something different. Uh, I sort of did the thing that I do. I put them in a room, and um, we put everybody in the room with them. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Fallon, the singer, I put him in the room so that he can see the drummer, the drummer can see him, the you know, guitar and bass. Um, Tim and Dan and, and, and JP, everybody can see each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I just let them play the song, you know, like, I mean, I know it sounds so simple, but let them play the song and, and do it to a like, okay, cool. We like this tempo. We like this. We like this arrangement. What happens here? Why are we doing this part? You know, just all those questions. Once we got all those done, JP likes to play to a click, but nobody else does. Mm -hmm. So I would just find, we'd find the tempo that we liked it at, uh, you know, I'd have him, uh, we'd push it forward. We'd push it back a little bit. We'd figure out where it felt good. Then what we do is we'd take a take with everybody playing. And, uh, then we'd be like, all right, cool. We love this take. All right. So now let's have Neil do like sing a scratch vocal to this take. He'd sing a scratch vocal to it. Then he'd come in or he'd go off and do whatever. Then I would work with them. We'd do two or three more takes after that, you know, sort of over his scratch vocal. That way we got a clean scratch vocal and we got a, um, a take that we liked. Often what ended up happening was maybe um, he, Neil wasn't as tight with them now. Mm -hmm. Right. The, we, we got a better take, you know? So then I would say, okay, cool. I love this take. We do any comping, like, you know, sometimes there was a course, it was great. We comp that in. And then once we got that take, right. I just immediately had Tim do like a double guitar. So like, cool. Just, here's, it's a double, just play it down once. Cool. Great. Mm -hmm. Done. You guys are done for a while. Then I'd have Neil come in and we would sing that song or 
or maybe we would do a song we did the day before or something and then we'd comp that and that would give the band a couple hours to go fuck off and keep neil involved and keep everybody keep the whole process rolling right and then we just as we kept going we would keep listening to 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 comp vocals okay cool i think this line we could be better we, we'll do that cool blah 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 comp that again you know yeah and over three weeks, you know, at some point we got done with the drums and we tore it all down. We made a big, huge stack of amps and uh, mic'd up a bunch of them. And then Tim came in here and we moved amps around and tried solos and Neil did his guitars. And, yeah. You know, we did background vocals and I mixed it. That's great. Uh, th three weeks. I love that. You know, go into a studio three weeks, come out later with something like that. <laughs> That's pretty normal for yeah. me. Three, four weeks is about normal mm -hmm. i mean you know if i if it's something that i'm producing that that's about normal and yeah. the reality is a lot of times these days to be honest with you that nobody has people don't have the money or the time <laughs> to yeah. be honest with you for for more right to, to do more i mean that you know now they gotta you know they gotta find somebody or find a place to stay i mean you yeah. know find somebody to stay with or whatever you know i was like mm -hmm. that's what i mean so it's just like you know, it's hard to hard to do long records. Yeah, it used to be. Yeah. So. About how long are your days? Uh, I am usually here every morning by ten, mm -hmm. and I am usually trying to leave here by seven or so. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, and then just very focused for that time. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Six days, usually doing six days. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what do you think about one more question? Sure. And then we'll let you get back to work. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. So this next one is a pre-submitted question. It's going to come from Kevin McKee, and okay. he's from Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware. That's clutch. <laughs> that's clutch territory there. Nice. Cool. Okay. He says, "Hi, Vance. First, thank you for all the valuable information and experience you've shared with us in the PureMix community." It's made a huge difference in my approach and results. Awesome. His question is, when approaching a mix with heavier guitars like Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown, do you have any advice for mixing in keyboard parts, which tend to be quite broad in the frequency spectrum and dynamic as well? Okay, so don't, so, so exactly. So keyboard parts, make, don't make them so broad and don't make them so wide in spectrum. <laughs> Uh, the, the good news is, is that the EQ faders on your desk, they go up and down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, to quote Fab's mantra, high pass everything. You know, if, if you don't need low end, because keyboards will do way more low end than guitars and basses, you know, mm -hmm. and drums. If you don't need that low end, don't use it. Don't play there. You know, try to play, th try to find things that fit around other things. Try to try to find sounds that, you know, aren't in that eh, ah, buzzy, fuzz, fun guitar thing. Yeah. You know? But uh, that's what I do. Yeah. You know, and try to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with Clutch, we did B3, which is cool. Mm -hmm. My B3 has an effects loop in it. So I got the polysat pedal out there. So he's like playing. And then on the title track, we did uh wah wah. Mm -hmm. So he's playing B3, wah wah B3 on oh, the cool. track, which is really cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, find something that, that fits, you know, and that's the deal. If, if you play the track and you're playing keys and it's not just like, Oh, that's that's a cool keyboard or synth or whatever sound. You yeah. shouldn't be doing it. Right, right. You know, if it if it blends in, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Any sense? Take it out. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying at the beginning of the of the talk about just things you know fitting together and you know sometimes you get things and they're all just a giant blob and yeah. yeah. You got to make you know I I try to do guitars so that you know the right side guitar doesn't sound like the left mm -hmm. so the two kind of do this right you know, they're, they're not on top of each other they're they're you know i'll even even when i'm putting a little bit of eq on the two mics because i usually always record with two mics you know i may put one at 5k and i'll do the other at three yeah or uh, you know or, or 1k and 4k mm -hmm. you know so that the two when you put them together 
they don't add up. You know, they, they, you know, when you put it in mono, that's why, like a lot of times I'm doing acoustic guitars, I'll use a microphone that's pretty dark, like a 77. Mm-hmm. And then my 582, which is really bright. Yeah. You know? And then when you put them in mono, you get this really nice sort of deep, beautiful thing. And then you pan them out and it's like, wow, now you, the, the acoustic guitar sounds really big and wide. Yeah. Even though it definitely sounds like it's here. Yeah. And that's the bright side. Right, right. But it sounds big, you know, so, yeah. you know, maybe do a double and flip them, you know, put yeah. the pipe and now you've got, you know, things like that. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. Those are all the things that I do. And I would say, you know, with keyboards, when you hear records you like that have keyboards, just just make sure that, you know, you're, you're hearing them, obviously, right? Mm-hmm. If you're hearing them, make sure that the, the the keyboards that you're recording you can hear. Right. So don't play things in the you know don't play don't play two handed. Play one handed. You know. You don't you don't need all those all that chords. Yeah. All the chords. You know. Yeah, and but it comes down to arrangement. Arrangement exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, one one final like note that I had I you know thinking back again to that to that Black Raider workshop. Um, Two things that I, I took away from that, it was uh, two words really, and it was intent and decisions. And uh, it was, you know, mostly just acting with intent and then also just making decisions. Yep. Yeah. I, I, at this point, can't even not act without intent or make decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I just recorded a record recently where the studio had no control room. Mm-hmm. I'm in the room with the band, you know, and... I was like, okay, I can't even listen. I mean, listen on headphones. That doesn't that that, that makes no sense because they're a band. They're playing in the room with me. Yeah. You know. So it's like, okay, you guys record, and then I'm gonna hit play, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know. And you know, I had my taste mic, and I had some rooms kind of, you know, I just kind of like did it by eye. A little bit of compression on the room mics, and mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, I, I think EQ wise, you know, this mic's gonna do this, and then we hit play, and I was like. Oh well, shit. Even though I can't hear it, I could actually do it. Yeah. You know. So yeah, yeah. It took a little more work later to get away I wanted, but yeah, it was cool. It's cool yeah. to do. And that was you probably know. a whole thing because you were in there with them, and that added a vibe to the record too. Yep. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It cool. makes it easy for overdubs and hard. Mm-hmm. Makes it easy to do them with communication. Hard to hear what's going on. Right. You know? Yeah. But, but yeah, it yeah. worked. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I just have a couple of housekeeping things and then we're going to get out of here. So yeah, congratulations again to our winners of the Isotope prize. And thank you again, Isotope for, for sponsoring this and helping us make it happen. You guys guys are awesome. And, uh, last thing I want to mention is just, uh, for any of you guys watching, this is, uh, obviously a pro member event. So thank you for being pro members and, and joining pure mix and, participating in the mix contest and the Q&A. You guys had great questions for us. Uh, I just want to remind you guys that we have a Facebook group that you can join. That's called yep. Pure Mixers. And you'll even see Vance pop up on there from time to time. I'm on there, yep. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great place to go. A bunch of like-minded members uh, and just, you know, the mentors pop in every, every once in a while when they can. And uh, yeah, so we hope to see you in there. So, awesome. Well, yeah, thanks Vince. everybody for having me and thanks for listening. And thanks for being a part of the thing. And, uh, you know, good work, good work on everybody. Appreciate it. That's great. Yeah. Thank you again. Just, just like the last question said, thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us. Yeah, really I'm appreciate happy it. to be here. You know, I've been doing it a long time. I might as well tell somebody about it. You know? <laughs> cool. All right. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you. You, Vince. All right. you guys be good. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.